I see subsidies as part of that big equation of the government overspending in areas where they, they need to cut back. You know, the government's bailing out the banks, but my question is, who's going to bail out the government? In response to the current economic crisis, our government has decided that taxpayers should bail out failing businesses. This is nothing new. During the Great Depression, the federal government started a subsidy program to get farmers through the hard times. Those programs are still in place today, even though farmers earn 30 percent more than the national average, and total farm income has more than doubled since 2002. Ken Galloway is a cotton farmer in Olton, Texas. We've always been small farmers. When my father retired, then I took over, and uh, I've been farming since 96. This is one of my cotton fields. Uh, I love farming. It's what I love to do. But Ken isn't your typical farmer. I'm unique in that I'm, I'm one of the few farmers that'll talk out of, against subsidies. The problem is it, these subsidies make the farmer reliant on the government and to that extent, they're bad. Al Montna grows rice near Sacramento and serves as the president of the California State Board of Food and Agriculture. To be in any one of the major commodity crops, the subsidy system has really become a major part of your income. We see them as an investment, and more and more see them as an investment in our national security. In recent years, farm subsidies have become increasingly unpopular. Groups like Oxfam on the left and the Heritage Foundation on the right are critical of farm subsidies, as is Dan Sumner, an economist at the University of California at Davis. The only decent reason to have, a sub have these subsidy programs is because we've always had them. Uh, there's no other reason you can think of. Uh, back in the old Soviet Union, you had people growing all kinds of stuff that nobody wanted. Well, we have the same thing here. We have a bunch of rice that costs 65 cents a pound to produce, uh, and the market isn't willing to pay anywhere near that. That's simple waste. That's taking real resources that we have as an economy and throwing them away. Many people who support farm subsidies are concerned about the plight of small family farmers. We celebrate the family farm not only because it gives us the food we eat, but it also maintains a way of life. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt introduced farm subsidies in the 1930s, 25 percent of the population lived on farms. Today, less than 1% of Americans live on farms that are larger, more efficient, and more productive than ever before. We've evolved to this highly capital-intensive industry. If you're small, you either get bigger or you, you know, quit farming because you can't, you can't make money. Since 1985, Willie Nelson and his friends at Farm Aid have raised more than $33 million to help save the small family farm. But despite what you may have heard, the vast majority of the $20 billion or so that our government doles out in subsidies each year ends up in the pockets of the richest farmers in America. They were never designed to be subsidies to help poor people. Most farmers, including those who grow our fruits and vegetables, don't receive any subsidies at all, while the lion's share goes to huge agribusiness firms like Archer Daniels Midland and Cargill. And get this, the long list of farm subsidy recipients includes billionaires like David Rockefeller, Fortune 500 companies, and lots of people who live in Manhattan. To get a sense of how ridiculous farm subsidies are, let's take a look at the sugar program. What we do here in the United States is keep out sugar from the rest of the world. The market price of sugar is about 10 cents a pound, average price around the world. Cost of production uh, is, is in the 20 cent a pound range or a little higher here in the United States. We could buy it from places that are good at producing sugar, say Brazil, for 10 cents. We pay 20 cents. That's a waste. So we're paying twice the world price for sugar while the sugar industry gets rich. Why don't we get rid of these tariffs? The cane farms are very large. And so each farm has millions and millions and millions of dollars riding on keeping these tariffs in place. In fact, the sugar industry donates around $3 million to Democratic and Republican members of Congress each year. And the cotton program is no better. Cotton farms in the United States, uh, almost all of them that grow upland cotton uh, get subsidies. The total cost of the taxpayer uh, tends to run around two or three billion dollars a year. It's about half the total revenue for the industry. Like all farm subsidies, the cotton program is a form of corporate welfare. 
But U.S. taxpayers aren't the only ones who pay the price. If you have a strong subsidy as they did in the past in cotton, then that encourages, when prices are low, people to overproduce, which simply holds the prices down, keeps them down low. That, of course, impacts uh, foreign countries and poor countries like Mali and, and West Africa considerably. I went to Mali about t two years ago. We went to raise awareness of the, the plight of, of farmers in third world countries like Mali. Of course, the poverty level there is, is very extreme. The farms are very small there, so that the effect on the family's income may be $100, $200 a year from the depressed prices they get caused by the U.S. cotton program. But that one or $200 a year is enough to feed a child, it's enough to send kids to school, it's enough to buy the medicine for the family for uh, several years. The U.S. government's refusal to scale back its farm subsidies has led to accusations of hypocrisy and highly contentious World Trade Organization talks. Fortunately, in this latest round, WTO round, uh, it more or less fell apart. The WTO talks fell apart because developing countries demanded an end to the protectionist policies of rich Western nations. We will not be a party to any consensus that does not recognize our rights to grow and to trade and to survive in this world economy. U.S. farmers like Almana are sympathetic because they have to compete against heavily subsidized farmers in other countries. Our competitors are subsidized. Uh, Europe to the highest levels and Japan to the highest levels. If you can believe it, a cow in Europe receives a subsidy of around two dollars per day, which is twice the income of a typical cotton farmer in Mali. U.S. agriculturalists would much rather compete in a free trade environment. And if we were to open those doors, as promised by many administrations, both Democratic and Republican, we would achieve that goal. And the need for a safety net under, under U.S. agriculture would be greatly diminished. So why doesn't our government do the right thing? Set a good example and end farm subsidies once and for all. Most of the members of Congress pay almost no attention to these programs. And in the districts where there are cotton farmers, each of those individual cotton farmers uh, are getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars from the program. They really care. They make sure their member of Congress knows that. The other reason they're able to keep them in place is that the detail of the actual legislation is mind-numbingly complicated and, frankly, boring. Complicated, boring, and really bad public policy, especially in these troubled economic times. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.